In part one, we have described how we have identified and located aquifers in contact with the Englishman River in its lower watershed. In this part of the series of presentations, we are going to describe how we figured out in which direction the groundwater was flowing in the various aquifers and at what rate. We have created 3D images to illustrate the flux of groundwater toward the river. So in which direction is groundwater moving in the aquifers? Characterizing aquifers is a complex and costly exercise because you need wells in order to reach aquifers and to monitor the depth and fluctuation of the level of the water table. The cost of drilling a well is typically between five and ten thousand dollars and you need several wells per aquifer to get the required information to define the movement of groundwater in an aquifer. Then you need to install monitoring equipment to collect the data <clears throat> and to store and process it. The final cost is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars if you want to do a proper job when you deal with several aquifers. The approach that we took was to involve the community for two reasons. The first one is that by using existing wells that owners would volunteer for monitoring, we would save the large cost of having to install new wells. The second reason is that we believe that the long-term health of watersheds depends upon the stewardship of the people who live in the watersheds. By getting them involved in its study, the community connects to its watershed, its complexity, and how it works. The people will then be able to more willingly modify their behavior and management of the land after they appreciate the direct connection between what happens at surface and what happens in the subsurface on the property, the property of the neighbors, and the local environment. This slide shows the dug wells with yellow symbols, the drilled wells in green, and in purple, the wells where we have installed data loggers. The five orange symbols represent the monitoring wells operated by the Ministry of Environment. So we had over 50 locations where data was collected without having to drill one well. The younger generation was welcome to supervise the work. The picture was taken when we were monitoring a drilled well. All the shadow dug wells were monitored by their owners with many benefits to this project. Twice, in February and in September, we used surveying equipment to measure the water elevation in ponds, streams, and where groundwater daylights in order to add locations defining the high and low elevations of the water table. In this region, the water tables reach the highest level in midwinter and their lowest level in the fall. Data loggers were installed in 15 wells, eight of them being inactive. Data loggers are small pieces of equipment, as shown in this picture, that were programmed to measure the height of the water column in the well and the groundwater temperature several times per day. We plotted the fluctuation of the elevation of the water table at all the locations monitored with data loggers since July 2009. It is presented using elevation along the left axis in meters above sea level. The right axis is used to plot the daily precipitation in millimeters. We have a wide range of elevations with the highest water table measured above 120 meters monitored on Little Mountain, and the lowest, 
close to sea level, recorded near the coast at Rathfrever Park. The shape of the curve varies as a function of the recharge dynamic of the aquifers. For example, the fastest and largest reaction to precipitation was observed in the well monitored on Little Mountain. This graph is built using water levels measured at 4 o'clock in the morning in order to present the situation of the aquifers at rest, assuming that wells have fully recovered after pumping for the locations where wells were, were in use. It appears that there is one exception for the well monitored on the island Timberland property at their northwest bay yard as shown with the scattered red crosses above 40 meter elevation. We'll discuss the situation of that well in more details later in part 4 of the presentation. The data loggers and the manual monitoring of the shallow wells provided information on the highest and lowest levels of the water table measured in the aquifers. The results are presented on this map for the locations with data loggers. The difference in amplitude between the highest and the lowest water level measured at a specific location ranges between 0.5 meter and 10 meter. It was important for us to characterize the flux under both high and low water table conditions, particularly to assess if there were sections of the Englishman River where there was a reversal of the flux between the river and the aquifers due to the seasonal fluctuation of the water table. And generally it does not happen. The aquifers keep providing groundwater to the river all year long. The survey that we completed in the winter and in the fall allowed us to define in detail the shape of the water table in areas relatively flat and where the groundwater movement had not been previously characterized due to the absence of wells. Piezometric contours were drawn. They are equivalent to topographic contours, but instead of defining the elevation of the ground, they define the elevation of the water table. Knowing the geometry of the piezometric contours allow us to infer the direction of the groundwater movement which is perpendicular to the lines. Our study has shown that in this area, which is an important spawning and rearing ground for salmon, there is an important flux of groundwater towards the Englishman River, both under high and low water table conditions. The groundwater movement in the aquifers in the lower 5 kilometers of the watershed is illustrated with the purple arrows. Along the left bank, we have a clear discharge of groundwater to the Englishman River. And on the right bank, the groundwater movement is more complex. There is a groundwater divide, as shown with the yellow line. Groundwater present east of the divide will flow east towards Craig Bay. Groundwater present west of the divide will discharge into the Englishman River. Along the right bank, north of the old highway and its orange bridge, groundwater fans either directly toward the ocean or towards the Englishman River and its estuary, the topography being relatively flat and precipitation generating a slight groundwater mound between the Englishman River and Rathfrever Park. The general movement of groundwater in the aquifers is illustrated with the blue arrows based on the interpretation of available information. We note that for the sandwiched system between kilometer 9 and kilometer 5, it appears that the hydraulic gradient indicates a groundwater movement in the shallow and medium aquifer towards the river, and a movement more towards Craig Bay to the north and the Strait of Georgia in the lower aquifer. There are indications of a deep aquifer 
in a buried valley acting as a bypass of the river band. This would require further investigation to be confirmed. So now that we have reached an understanding about the direction of the groundwater movement in the aquifers, we need to know how much groundwater is moving through the aquifers and the flux of groundwater toward the Englishman River. The flux of groundwater through an aquifer is a function of how permeable it is. A coarse gravel will have large voids between its particles and will let water move very freely. The size of the pores, the tubes made by the voids between the particles of a fine sand, by comparison, would be much smaller. The resulting hydraulic conductivity of the fine sand would be much smaller, maybe 100 times smaller. The transmissivity of an aquifer is obtained by multiplying the thickness of the aquifer by the value of its hydraulic conductivity. The groundwater flux is also a function of the drop in energy as groundwater moves through the aquifer. The level of energy is given by the elevation of the water table. So by measuring the water table at two locations along the flow path of the groundwater, one can estimate the slope of the water table, which is also called the hydraulic gradient. By multiplying this hydraulic gradient by the transmissivity, we can estimate the movement of groundwater through the aquifer. And by multiplying by the section of the aquifer it goes through, we then obtain the flux of groundwater moving through the aquifers. The depth to water measured in the wells has given us the information to estimate the slope of the water table. So now we have an estimate of the direction of the water, shown with the blue arrows, and the slope of the water table, indicated by the water table elevation lines. The Ministry of Environment has tabulated information about the estimated hydraulic conductivity of aquifers after compiling and reviewing engineering reports. The red symbols show the locations where data about the hydraulic conductivity of aquifers is available. In order to visualize the flux between the aquifers and the Englishman River, we created this image. You can imagine you are walking, swimming, or tubing down the Englishman River between 16 and 10 kilometers. On your left, you see the face of the left bank, and on your right, the right bank. The picture of the land on both sides allows you to position yourself where you are in the watershed. The blue line represents the elevation of the river. The colored shapes represent the sections where the aquifers intersect both banks. And the arrows express the flux of groundwater discharging into the river. The estimate of the flux is summarized in the boxes in liter per second or cubic meter per day. The ratio between the flux from the aquifers and the summer river lowest flow rate is expressed as a percentage to show how much the aquifers participate in providing water to the Englishman River during its period of low flows. So between 16 and 10 kilometers, the aquifers are providing water to the Englishman River but slightly, with fluxes representing approximately 2% of the Englishman River summer flow. Between 10 and 5 kilometers, we have more aquifers. They are thicker and providing larger fluxes. Together, they supply over 13% of the summer low flow of the Englishman River. 
As we keep going down the river, we are now between kilometer 5 and the estuary. There are several aquifers on both banks of the river. Their geometry is complex and they provide an estimated 10% of the summer low flow. 